Well, thank you very much indeed, Roland, for a kind introduction. It, it, it is great to be back here after 10 years. It wasn't so great coming here today. For some reason, the flight from London to Dublin was full of Australians. <laughs> now, at least we have an Australian cameraman, uh, but at least he's not dressed in gold and green like all these characters were. And I, I'm only one-eighth Scottish, only one-eighth Irish, uh, and I'm only moderately interested in rugby football, but gosh, I was upset yesterday. <laughs> and then even more upset by the fact that the, the semi-finals of this competition, see, uh, uh, the quarter-finals have seen the defeat of Scotland, Ireland, Wales and France, and the victory of Argentina, Australia, New Zealand and South Africa. And I suddenly realised I was a Northern Hemisphere chauvinist, <laughs> which is some, an identity I didn't know I possessed. Now, I did, I did think it was a bit extreme when the BBC commentator said, Scotland, the hopes of half the planet rest with you. <laughs> I thought, yeah, in China, Russia, Poland, Germany, United States, are they really caring so much? Uh, but this is not entirely unrelated to my talk. It's, it's a sort of way I'm going to bring it in. Um, because it's partly about ident when, uh, identities and when they're important. Um, because one of the problems with Europe is it's, it's difficult to have an identity with it. And actually, this hemisphere stuff, it's not actually the whole Northern Hemisphere. This is Europe against the Southern Hemisphere. And I'm far less interested in golf than I am in <coughs> rugby. But I always take enormous interest in the Ryder Cup. Because it's the only occasion where I can actually be a European uh, patriot. Um, and it's interesting that the Ryder Cup, as you probably know, used to be the United States versus Britain and Ireland, the British Isles. Um, and, they, and, and the Americans always won. And if I, it was eventually they who said, look, why don't you guys strengthen your demographic base a bit and why don't we make this Europe? And of course, the British will only do anything with Europe if the Americans tell them they can. And so, <laughs> and so they did. And as a result, now the Americans usually lose. Um, the, now, uh, here's, an, here's an artificial link, if you like, right? Yeah, the British only do things with Europe if the Americans say they can. But the, the British Labour movement, uh, which, which uh, historically was very hostile indeed to the, the European Union or European Common Market, as it was called in those days, uh, changed its mind about it for a different reason. Uh, and this was during the early years of the Thatcher government in Britain, which is very, very hostile to, the lab to, to trade unions and to social policy and then appeared at the TUC conference one year, uh, Jacques Delors, <coughs> who gave a very, very different view from the British government to the role of organized labor. Uh, leading the General Secretary of the TUC, the Trade Union Congress, who was not known for his wit, to say at the end of it, Delors is our shepherd. Uh, <coughs> now, it was a few years after that, though, that one of his successors, John Monks, became who had been General Secretary of the CUC, became the President or General Secretary leader of the European Trade Union Congress. By then, Jacques Delors had and, and, uh, long gone, and Barroso was now installed as the Chairman of the, commis as the, uh, of the Commission, President of the Commission. And Monks went to see him. And Barroso said, what have you come to see me for? And he said, I've come to talk to you about social Europe. And Barroso said, in that case, you are 10 years too late for your appointment. We don't talk about that anymore. Uh, <clears throat> and that is, that, what, that's a change that took place, right? Uh, the, and the, 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 the law uh, presidency, followed by Romano Prodi, uh, maintained this notion that there was a social part to the European agenda. And then that, start, starting with Barroso, really, um, who owes his appointment as commissioner mainly to Tony Blair. Um, uh, it, it changed, and, and there was an, a, a, a belief that you'd got to somehow get rid of the notion of social Europe. Now, I, I don't actually accept the notion of social Europe as an empirical reality. Um, there, is, there is no European social model. Why should there be? Uh, why should there be anything that links sort of Finland, Greece, Poland and Ireland in, in one sort of social model, given that there is so little European social policy, why should it be? There is, there is a kind of Northwest European social model uh, with all sorts of exceptions within it, which it really it, it, alone in the world is able to 
uh, combine economic dynamism with a, a high degree of, of equality and strong social policy and strong trade unions. And with, as exceptions all over the place, but Northwest Europe is the only place in the world, um, if you in include Slovenia in Northwest Europe, that, um, that, that where you find these characteristics. But often when people are wanting to criticize social Europe, what they do is to, to look at economic issues in southwestern Europe and attribute those to what goes on in northwestern Europe. Um, so actually the, the, the idea of social Europe isn't very useful because it's used in rather <coughs> meretricious ways. Uh, nevertheless, there are major problems emerging as we move more and more towards a division between uh, a Europe that is concerned with competition policy and trading arrangements and nation states that are concerned with social policy. And there is a growing consensus on both the left and the right of the European spectrum that it would be quite a good idea if we had that kind of division of labor. Uh, from my perspective, it's entirely disastrous. Um, for two reasons. Uh, first, well, they're the same reason in the end, but they, they sort of come round to um, the same thing. And the, the main problem is that this sets markets against social policy uh, as a, a division of labor between two levels. Now, it's true that in nearly all political rhetoric, both left and right, uh, markets are set against social policy. They're, se they're seen as a zero-sum game between more market and, and social policy. Right? The, 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 uh, the, they're, they're enemies. And also, of course, the, the political divisions of most countries, uh, it, 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 certainly in Western Europe, with the exception of Ireland, uh, are based around that, 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 that major divide between more market or more social policy. So it's quite easy to see it, why, that it should be a zero-sum game. But actually, in practice, it isn't. Because one of the things that takes place in economies is that as you make mar more markets, and often there are enormous efficiency gains from doing that. Um, I sometimes, I'm, I, I'm sometimes not sure whether I'm a right-wing social democrat or an extreme left neoliberal, but I'm, I'm sort of somewhere around there, and I'm a friend of markets. <coughs> and you want more markets, but you have to recognize that one of the ways in which markets achieve their work is by doing a lot of damage, by creating a lot of externalities that they don't pick up. And so actually, uh, whatever the politics of the matter is, uh, uh, is um, Mark, the marketization actually c calls into being a need for social policy, either to compensate victims uh, or to provide an infrastructure of collective goods that market processes themselves find it very difficult to do. And, uh, and the person who really wrote about all of this first is Karl Polanyi. Uh, I mean, he's a, a Hungarian uh, writing about the early stages of the British well, not the, agri the agricultural revolution, really, before the Industrial Revolution, um, uh, and doing this in the 1940s. And yet he, he's one of the most quoted social scientists at the present time. You think, why on earth does a Hungarian who writes about the British agricultural revolution, mainly writing in Canada in the 1940s, why on earth is he seen as so relevant? And it's precisely because he's the person who worked this out for us all and, and demonstrated it, how... Uh, markets do a kind of damage to society. They destroy a lot of institutions, quite often institutions that deserve to be destroyed. Um, but nevertheless, that then creates problems. And so if, if you look at the world through a Polanyan perspective, you don't see a zero-sum game between markets uh, uh, and social policy. You actually see them as interdependent, complementary. Uh, so that's, that's the, the general point. That, that, that is just my sort of main burden of my argument. And then you then go, go, go back to this European issue and say, aha, what happens then if you say marketization uh, is, well, marketization is going to be done at national level as well, but marketization, increasing trade freedom, that's European business. Social policy is nation state business. You're then saying that this extremely difficult relationship uh, where 
it's possible to get creative solutions, but where political conflict is constantly turning a positive sum game into a zero sum game, that is then going to be overlaid by a whole level of other conflicts and difficulties by uh, a conflict between levels. Um, and that's why the, the present trend of saying we need to keep these levels separate uh, disturbs me considerably. Uh, but we need, in, to get some perspective on this, uh, we need to look at what actually is the history of the relationship between European integration and social policy. Because it, it's, it's, it's a quite an intricate story. And I've, I've already pointed out this extreme contrast between the approach of the Delors and the Barroso uh, commissions. Uh, and there's, there, there is no simple story, either e evolutionary growth or, or, of, or of no growth. Um, it's true that this, uh, if, 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 Europe, if European integration has a social agenda, it has always been a, a, a poor sister to the main task of making markets. That, 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 that's quite clear. Uh, and some of the reasons for that have been analysed theoretically in a very elegant way by Fritz Sharp, who's probably the person who knows more about this issue than anybody else. And Fritz has argued that um, what, when you make markets, you're basically getting rid of institutions or protectionist arrangements usually. So you, what you're, you, you, it's, it's a ne negative task. He calls it negative integration. Uh, if you actually try and build social policy, uh, you've then got a much more difficult task. It's much more difficult to get agreement about a positive construction than it is to demolish. Because demo there's only one way to demolish. That's to tear something down. There's lots of ways of putting something in its place. I, I don't think he's entirely right, actually. Uh, there's, a, a, there's a kind of Hayekian assumption behind that, that if you tear institutions down, what you're left with is markets. Um, but we know, we, if, if we learn anything from the history of Eastern Europe, not so much Central Europe, Russia and Eastern Europe after 1990, it is that tearing institutions down uh, doesn't actually leave you with markets, it leaves you with gangsters. This is where, this is where Hobbes was right, right? Uh, like, like, uh, Hayek was completely wrong, Hayek believes sta in the state of nature you have markets, no, in the state of nature you get mafia uh, uh, and, 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 and a lot of unpleasant things. Uh, but that aside, uh, otherwise, uh, Fritz's insight is a very important one, that it's much easier to agree about uh, setting up markets. Partly, not, not, so, well, not so much because if you tear down protectionist things, you're left with markets, but partly because, sadly, economic science is not necessarily uh, better founded than the rest of us, but it's more confident about itself and about what it recommends, which I'll come back to this at a, few, uh, a few more times in the next, hour, in the next half hour. So, th th yes, the, 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 any social policy side of European construction has always been weaker than uh, the economic side, although there was a very special reason for that in the beginning, which is outside the theoretical scope of Sharp's argument, and which, which is much more empirical, and that was that that, that the early years of the construction of Europe, where the, the main countries are, uh, had either been Nazi and fascist or allowed themselves to be occupied by Nazis and fascists, uh, there was a serious doubt over the legitimacy of the new national regimes. They needed to bond with their people. Uh, fr in France and Italy, the majority of the working class movement was communist. A uh, big question in the early years of the 1950s over where the German workers would go, because no one really knew how the competition between East and West Germany was going to work out. Things got a bit easier after 1953 when Russian troops were, were shooting strikers dead in the streets of Berlin, but that did clarify issues a bit for German workers. But uh, th th it was a very anxious time going right through the f to, to the late 50s. And so it was very important that the nation states were able to do things that would bond their people to them. And social policy, welfare state reconstruction and, and new construction was important to their project. So th they didn't really want Europe to be getting the credit for any establishment of, of decent pension schemes and so forth. So there, there were very political, practical reasons, uh, as well as the sharp reasons, 
why all concentration was on the breaking down of trade barriers. Although, right there in the Treaty of Rome, from the very beginning, is that notion of wanting an ever closer union. The British at the moment are saying, we never signed up for ever closer union. We were signed up to a common market and trade. Where's all this stuff come from? Uh, well, actually, it was in the Treaty of Rome, and it's right at the beginning of the Treaty of Rome. Uh, and they knew, the British knew that was in there when they took on membership. But they think now they want that reversed, and they want just a loose trading agreement. Um, and it's about the impossibility of that objective that I'm trying to concentrate now. Um, but I, actually, that doesn't mean there was no social policy in the early construction of Europe. The actual individual social rights, those sort of whether an Italian working in Germany is entitled to a pension of some kind, at that level of, of nuts and bolts, it was a very limited, a very sort of economist's perception, and that is that if people were to be able to have the right to move around Europe, and that the notion of free movement was always there, that, um, that, that, that therefore they, they, they need to be able to have social rights, that they, that they needed to have portable social rights. And so a lot of stuff about uh, ensuring there aren't barriers to movement. And m most of the movement going on within Europe in the early decade or so was, was, was Italians going to work in, in, in Germany and Luxembourg and, and the, um, the Netherlands. But um, the, 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 social, the individual social policy was limited to this business of it. People mustn't have their ability to move and, and have efficient labour market movement by uh, not being able to carry social benefits with them. Extremely narrow perspective. But uh, in another sense, you can say social policy was always very big in the European agenda. And the, 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 or, or at least policy other than pure trading policy. Uh, the two great pillars of European integration, the common agricultural policy and the, and the coal and steel community, uh, were both much more than trading. And the, the, the agricultural policy uh, eventually becomes a, a dirty game whereby big agricultural companies in, 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 in agribusiness in Northern Europe uh, manages to get uh, very good deals. It started off as being a way of gradually uh, providing a, a, a gentle euthanasia of the European peasantry uh, and ensuring that while they're being wiped out, they don't actually radicalise and become communist uh, as well as the industrial workers. So that, that, note that, that France and Italy in particular, to a lesser extent Germany and the other c countries, have got these enormous peasant classes that are clearly going to disappear. And, and can you make sure they don't get totally displaced and disoriented like sort of in, in the 18th and 19th century with displaced agricultural workers. So that, that was, and the, the motive was mainly political, the need to ensure these people carried on voting for Christian parties, but uh, it was a social policy. Uh, the coal and steel community wasn't as much social policy, but that's mainly about solving the problem of the fact that the main resources of coal and iron ore uh, in Europe, or along the most con what was the contested border of Europe, um, uh, which was uh, between Germany and France, and, uh, uh, and sort of Luxembourg, bits of Belgium, Alsace, Lorraine, um, the, the, the Ruhr, uh, the, the, the Germany, the, 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 the wrong side of the Rhine. Uh, this is where, uh, and the, 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 these were the, the, the quarrels over these resources were seen at the heart of the problems of the relationship between France and Germany. Uh, the, the German coal and steel industry, the Montamba Reich as it's called, was fundamental to the industrial support of Adolf Hitler. So the, the coal and steel community wasn't just about trade, it, there was a serious political project there uh, about neut politically neutralizing that sector of the economy and, and, and ensuring it no longer it could no, would no longer be a source of major um, struggle between France and Germany. So th this might not be social policy, but it's not just pure trade either. Then a few years after that, and this is when Europe, you see 1950s Europe, early 60s Europe, is still industrializing Europe. Right? Peasantry is declining, coal and steel are important. Uh, then come the first shocks of what we've now got used to and have got beyond. And this is when these, some of these major industries like steel, like shipbuilding, like certain kinds of heavy engineering at first, gradually spreading to other things, start to be non-viable 
in not only in Western Europe, but in the, in the, in, in the United States and eventually Japan as well. And there was enormous industrial decline about to happen. Um, and that's when the European Union starts to develop the structural funds. And the structural funds are, in a way, they have a similar logic to the, to the agriculture policy, and that is there's enormous disruption going to happen here, and whole regions are going to lose their main f w way of life. And, and we, th there needs to be something to provide new, new infrastructure, to in, 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 equip these parts of Europe uh, to, to take to into new industries, uh, well, partly propping them up during the transition, so the transition is not too favourable, too unfavourable, and then uh, to, to, to enable them to restructure. And you've got the structural funds, which they are social policy in that more extended sense of uh, sort of positive social policy of, of ensuring that populations are going to have a reasonable transition out of one way of life to another one. Uh, without too much disruption through unemployment and, and, and general misery. <coughs> so the structural funds are an important step towards uh, a, 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 a social policy for European countries at the level of, of the European Union. And then not long after that, um, at the 1980s, uh, Europe discovers, European Union institutions discover a new, uh, well, learn a new set of capacities. And that is not how to manage decline, as they were with agriculture and with, 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 with the structural funds, but how to help countries who have never really had a modern uh, infrastructure to get one. Uh, and interestingly, and rather sadly in retrospect, the pioneer country that enabled Europe to learn how to do this was Greece. Uh, Greece, then Spain and Portugal, when they entered the European Union after coming out of their, their fascist periods um, with very, very backward economies. And it was the first in Greece, Greece was the first one of the three to join the European Union. Um, that, that was when a new kind of building up of infrastructure um, started to develop. Uh, uh, lessons learned in, in Southwest Europe, which were, have then been extremely valuable in um, uh, it, 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 later on in the 1990s and in more recently, in building up infrastructure in the former Soviet bloc countries who entered Europe. And at, at the moment, uh, the, 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 most of the countries in Central and Eastern Europe uh, are mainly a force for, for pursuing marketization-only policies. I mean, in the words of Klaus, the uh, Czech politician, who famously said, we want the market with no adjectives. Uh, that they can do that because they've actually had a load of the adjectives uh, uh, provided for them through European funding during their transition years. So that, that, that was another way in which we got an expanded, expanded concept of infrastructure um, coming in to being a, a European project. And if you walk around Athens, as I was doing a couple of months ago, beautiful urban transport system. Uh, and you think, where did all this come from? Um, it's the European Union. Um, interestingly, and this is an irrelevant digression, not so long afterwards I was wandering about Istanbul um, and having the same impression. Well, where did this railway system come from? That wasn't the European Union. No, that is ever since the Islamic turn of the Turkish state, a lot of rather nostalgic billionaires in the oil-rich part of the Islamic world uh, have thought it would be great to build up the Ottomans again uh, and, go, um, and build up Istanbul, and they've started to invest. That's where that investment's coming from, which is an interesting insight into, um, into relations between Europe and Turkey and the Islamic world. So that, that is an aside, that one. Um, but so one has got... A, a, it, if you take an expanded sense of social policy, and I think we should see social policy as about infrastructure uh, and not just about individual benefits, then one sees a gradually enriching of that part of Europe, going, that, that side of European business going on through the years. And then we really reach a crucial point um, which really brings out the Polanyan 
argument about the complementary nature of marketization and social policy, uh, which the very, if you really want to know, the start of it all, because it, it, this is the single market policy, the start of it all, those of you who don't know uh, the history of the single market policy, the start is usually credited to be the famous dispute between France and Germany over uh, creme de cassis de Dijon, which uh, grown up Ribena, you know, that um, highly alcoholic blackcurrant drink that you normally find nowadays in Kier, uh, or Kier Royale, if you can afford it. Uh, now, what happened was that the Germans had their own alcoholic blackcurrant drink, not a very good one, not very famous. And in order to protect that industry, the Germans were resisting all uh, attempts at reducing tariff barriers. And they, 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 we've got that. Now, at that point, you, 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 could, you could maintain protection for industries if you could cite various reasons. And one of the reasons you could give was health. So when the Commission comes along to Germany and says, why are you blocking imports of creme de cassis de Dijon? They said, health reasons. So they said, right, what's the health reason? So they, the German chemists started to analyze the two alcohols. And to their distress, they found that the German one was actually much more alcoholic. So they developed this ingenious argument, which may be the worst argument ever developed, <laughs> ever produced by a, an advanced uh, democracy. Uh, and that was, they said, the, the French one is a lot weaker in its alcohol content. Uh, that means if young Germans start drinking creme de cassis de Dijon, and then one day drink the German one, they'll suddenly be taking in far more alcohol, and this could damage their health. The commission was not impressed by this argument. And they said, we can't have arguments of this kind being used anymore. We've got to do something about this. And they launched this enormously ambitious program of the single market. Uh, that, is, that is the case. I mean, it, would, it would have happened anyway. Just like if the Archduke hadn't been shot, they would still have had the First World War. If there had not been creme de cassis de Dijon, we'd have still had the single market. But it was the sort of the, the, the trigger. And so one got this huge program of gradually reaching agreements around it, it, right across the economy about shared accepted product standards because they, they, they'd always tried to develop European integration by harmonization but, but they now moved to a softer thing and that is you've got you don't all have to have the same thing but you've got to have a mutually recognized standard and you've got this enormous work of producing standards um, which actually means that most of the world has to accept European standards for most products um, because the European Union is the biggest market in the world. And so if, and if American firms or Japanese firms want to sell to Europe, they've got to meet certain product standards, so they might as well do it for all of their products. Uh, it's something the British don't realize. If they leave the European Union, they've still got to accept European standards. They just don't get a share in making them anymore. Uh, so but one got the, the, this is a major marketization program because this is opening up trade, breaking down barriers everywhere you can find, a real sort of uh, a, 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 an economist dream. But, and I, and I think Jacques Delors is intelligent enough to have thought this through explicitly. I don't think this is a chance thing because I think he understood Polanyi, uh, that if you're going to do this, you're going to cause a lot of disruption to people's lives. There's going to be a lot of hassle. Uh, you've really got to therefore expand a wider agenda. If Europe's going to keep its legitimacy for having the single market, it's got to do other things. Uh, and so it's at that same time that one gets the welcoming of the social partners uh, of trade unions and employers' bodies into European policy making. Partly, this is part of the single market program because um, if, if it, uh, I see, up and up, it's very interesting that up until the single market program, the only trade unions who are, 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 are very much involved in, in European business are the agricultural unions, one of the weakest of all the types of unions, and the steel and coal unions, the metal, metal industry unions and, uh, and coal mining unions, because they were the ones that were mainly touched by Europe. Well, now what was happening is that everyone was being touched by Europe, first in manufacturing and then later on, uh, uh, more controversially, in services. And so uh, a lot of people start coming to Brussels. Trade unions start setting up offices in Brussels. And the Commission starts to welcome them in. And in particular, what looked as though it was going to be a very major development, but it, in the end it, it, it's proved to be very disappointing, the, the fact that within an individual sector or across a whole area, 
employers, groups and unions could come together and say to the Commission, we think we need to have a directive on paternity leave or the various, uh, various issues um, that eventually got embedded into to European policy making. So the, the employers and, 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 and unions, if they agreed on something, the Commission would take this over and then it would, would become a directive of the Commission. It's the thing that the British objected to most strongly during that whole time. Uh, and this was a, 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 a very, very uh, pure case of Polanyi's logic working. Because you're making more markets, you find you get a kind of social agenda arrives. Uh, at the same time, the, the, the Law Commission started to build its direct links with regions and with cities right across Europe. And, and regions and cities started to have offices in Brussels. And when, Rather early on, before, uh, Catalonia said it wanted to have its regional office in Brussels, and the Spanish state said, "This is treason. I, you, you don't. Um, you will have tanks on your lawn." But it, it's now just normal. I mean, it, it, it's like the city of Birmingham has a, an office in Brussels, because the, what was happening was that the Commission was strengthening its links with a whole load of social actors. And, and extending its policy making, its advice, its, uh, 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 and its involvement uh, 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 across quite a range of fields. Uh, I remember I had a student who did a thesis on, on this role of the Commission getting into localities. And, and she found, as she was comparing France and Britain, and there were these. There were, these, there were some things you could get for very poor areas and all sorts of social facilities. Uh, and in, in East London, some councils were man managing to get all sorts of things done but with European money. And because the British government was very suspicious of this and they insisted on sending civil servants to these meetings. And so this, a, senior, a civil servant from... from from Westminster, from Whitehall, would have to come out and sit on a committee about whether a set of table tennis tables should be bought for some youth club somewhere in the East End. Uh, and this was, well, it was very much the DeLorean vision that you, you build, link, partly to strengthen the legitimacy of the European Union, uh, because it's about to do all these things with markets. And that was really the high point. Uh, it, it, it continued under Romano Prodi with, with less imagination, but the, the agenda wasn't changed. Uh, but meanwhile, it's, be, it's all being undermined because uh, when you get to the mid-90s, there is this belief that Europe has become sclerotic uh, in, uh, and it has far less economic growth than the United States. And the reason for this must be because Americans don't have any social policy and they don't have any trade unions, whereas Europeans do. And there was this very heavy agenda about getting out of social policy. Uh, and then I think at the same... T now, at, at the time, people didn't realise just how dependent economic growth in Britain and the United States and Ireland and one or two other places were on a financial sector that was actually providing a total illusion of growth. Um, and which by 2008 uh, 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 had collapsed. Uh, at the same time, the new countries of Eastern Europe, were in, Central Europe, were entering, and they had very different political perspectives. For them, social policy was part of communism, and they really wanted to get rid of all this, and they, they wanted markets. Um, and so that the agenda starts to come to a stop. Uh, hence, Barroso's remarks to John Monks, you've come to 10 years too late for your appointment. Since then, the Polanyian coupling has come adrift. And increasingly, Europe is about making markets without recognizing. Uh, it's not, not uh, so, the social aspect. It's not entirely true. A lot of infrastructure work continues. But the, that whole series of, the, uh, uh, of social directives has come to an end. Um, uh, and the European court, which has it, which it follows its own logic, has, uh, as, as you will know from other work you've done, has started to interfere uh, with or intervene in what had been seen as, as very much a national territory, uh, in particular court decisions that have uh, made, that have found contradictory to competition law, various Scandinavian uh, and Finnish 
um, industrial relations institutions. In institutions actually work extremely well, don't interfere with competition, um, because these are these small open economies that have always been exposed to world trade and have never been protectionist, are, aren't in danger of having protectionism. Um, because their, inst their inter industrial relations institutions work in a way that most of the time avoids protectionism. But the, the court can't see that. The court just follows a, 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 a kind of economics and law logic that can't look at social institutions and how they work. It, it just has a very simple model of, uh, 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 as it comes out of the, the economics and law tradition, it just it knows what a pure market is, and it knows what a pure mar what something that isn't a pure market is, and it what, it doesn't like them. Uh, meanwhile, we've also had the extension of competition law to public services, um, and w which, m to the extent that you get an extension of competition law to public services, you are in a way requiring a privatisation agenda. Uh, now, governments can reserve areas. They can say, no, this, this is public service. Uh, and, uh, but even then, it's not clear-cut, and that there is a very famous case, which I'm not sure whether it's been resolved yet. I have to find out, because I need to know which direction it's resolved. The case of Dutch social housing. The Netherlands has a rather large, large amount of social housing. And it's seen in the Netherlands as being a kind of way people might choose to live. They might choose to rent their uh, accommodation, not, not to buy a house and not to rent from a private landlord, but to rent from a local authority. And that's just seen as something you might want to do. Uh, and they call it social housing. Um, and it's a rather high percentage. So the Dutch private house builders, or private, ha uh, uh, private housing industry, went to the European court and says, this isn't what we mean by social policy. This is just any old Dutch person can get social housing. They don't have to be poor. Uh, this is a bloated sector. We therefore think it shouldn't be covered by the social policy exemption. And this is going through the courts. And it's been a long while. It's an extremely difficult case to resolve as to, to what actually social policy means. Um, uh, but it, it, if that Dutch case turns out that the, 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 um, the, the ha private house builders win, then it means social policy, uh, 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 the, the definition of social policy that can be exempt from competition law gets very small. If we get, and there's no t we might, it might come up in discussion, but there's no time to talk about it in detail now, if we really get the Transatlantic Trade and Investment uh, Partnership uh, with its regime of private law jurisdiction of disputes between corporations and governments, then um, th that sort of case will multiply even further. Uh, and then another step in the kind of de-socialization, the sort of de of Europe, has come with the uh, conditions imposed on Ireland and the Southwest, Euro Southwest European debtor nations. Now, the Irish, I, I may be wrong, but it seemed to me the Irish political elite was quite happy to have these conditions because it wanted to do some of these things already. Um, you may dis I may be wrong about that, and you can tell me. Um, but, uh, bless you. Um, what here, the, con the conditions imposed on the debtor countries, and especially Greece, because Greece is in a very special status from all the others. It actually has these formal memoranda that it's required to follow. These said, it's, it, the trouble is it's, it's very difficult really to take up sides on the Greek case because Greek, the Greek social state, if it is a social state, uh, was not one to want to defend. Uh, it's clientelistic. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's one of the least redistributive of the welfare states. Um, it, it's a rich middle class, mainly benefits from it. Uh, the, the reason for the, the, the Greek debt is not because they're funding wonderful social policy of a sort of Scandinavian kind, but because they can't get any tax out of their rich population or, or indeed their, the rest of their population, partly through inefficiency, partly through pure corruption. So th there's nothing to defend in traditional Greek social policy. And in, in fact, uh, the, 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 the Syriza-led government is probably uh, the, the, the best government Greece has had for, for implementing a, a, a decent-looking social policy uh, free of corruption, because it doesn't so far have all the patronage links that, that had messed up 
the Greek welfare state. So there's, there's not much to defend in the Greek welfare state. And there's no way you can use Keynesian arguments to say uh, structural debt of a massive kind should continue indefinitely because the government is unwilling to, to raise taxes to cover its spending. On the other hand, if you look at the conditions imposed in the memorandum, especially the first memorandum, the very new one this summer actually is, is a lot more sophisticated. But the first one, it was just applying a totally simple neoliberal logic. It was just wherever you can see uh, anything that might impede with free markets, you've got to get rid of it. Right? So, okay, you can keep a minimum wage, but you can't have trade unions involved in fixing it. Uh, it, it just went through uh, in that sort of mindless way that economic theory has of, of just seeing market or non-market, uh, market good, non-market bad. Uh, and that they were the conditions in the memorandum. So there was, there, was no, there was nothing there about um, seeing uh, social policy as something that might, act, or certain kinds of social policy, as something that might actually contribute to stabilizing a population and also to improving an economy. Um, in the past, as I said before, Greece has had masses of European money for its infrastructure, which hasn't it's used in certain ways. Um, but that, 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 there's none of that. There's nothing about the social investment welfare state in that memorandum. Nothing about flex security. No, all of those things that seem to have entered into European thinking over the previous decades, when, when the chips are down, it just goes out of the window. And one saw just how weakly established it therefore was. And then the final case to consider uh, is what is happening now with the free movement of labor. Uh, Free movement of labor is interpreted in a purely economic liberal way. And that is that for efficient labor markets, it's important that people can move wherever there's jobs. Right? Uh, and given long enough, um, if enough Poles come and live in Western Europe, there'll be labor market shortages in Poland, so Polish wages will rise. And then eventually you, you don't get so much movement. And that was, but, um, Economists never care about what goes on in the, t in the meantime. Uh, and they, don't, and they, they have a view of labor markets where in an ideal world there wouldn't be any social policy, there wouldn't be any state pensions, there wouldn't be any disablement benefits, there wouldn't be any state pr publicly provided schools and hospitals. And the, so so the, they, they don't want to acknowledge a world where all these things actually exist. And so the free movement of labor policy comes with no important social policy implications. No one says if, if there's enormous arrival of new people in a country, who's meant to fund the new, to pay for the new schools? Is that, is that all the job of the receiving country? Well, you might say, yeah, because actually, given that immigrants tend to be of working age, uh, uh, they usually make a, a, a net contribution to a country. Uh, they, they, assuming they're not working in the black economy, which is a very big assumption, if they're assuming they're paying taxes, actually they very quickly start to make a net contribution supporting the elderly, non-working people like myself, uh, in, uh, who are natives of Western Europe. But th there are transitions before you reach that point. There are burdens that come on Im in immigrant receiving countries that the policy do doesn't say anything about. Because social policy, as we've developed it, uh, and welfare states as we've developed them, are, have historically been about social citizenship. And you see it mostly developed in the, the Scandinavian countries, but not only there, that uh, I am a citizen of this country, therefore I have certain entitlements which are part of my shared inheritance of being of being a citizen of this country. And this, this is the kind of nas uh, an underlying nationalism that's there in welfare states. And you can see I'm gradually getting back to why I'm upset about Australia um, beating Scotland. That, uh, what, that, 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 that in the welfare state, people are, are saying, yes, I accept that my fellow Swedes, my fellow Spaniards uh, should have some rights and I, 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 because we're all here together. It's very, very interesting to compare the German West German reaction to the collapse of East Germany, to their reactions to the collapse of Greece. And now, it wasn't trouble-free, German integration. Uh, there, wa there was controversy about it, about letting, because about, once East Germany had been joined to West Germany, then there was enormous transfer of funds took place. 
colossal transfer of funds, which are, were actually very successful results, really. I mean, that's something I was looking at a few months, weeks ago that really surprised me, that the difference, the difference in household in, per capita, in, uh, household d disposable income between the richest land in Germany and the poorest land in East Germany is smaller than the difference between London and Wales. Uh, so that, that's a measure of the success of, of German integration, actually. Uh, and, and Germans were willing to pay for that. West Germans were willing to pay taxes for that. Uh, for several years, the country had a very hard time, actually, uh, the first few, uh, uh, and didn't do so well. Uh, and uh, it, well, it, wasn't in, it wasn't without controversy, but in general, said, yeah, of course, they're fellow Germans, right? But Germans don't say that about Greeks. They don't say they're fellow Europeans. They don't even say we're really doing this just to save German banks, which is what they could say. Yeah. Uh, so so that, that, and this is the, the, the limits to identity. And it, social policy historically has not been a, just a technocratic device where a few experts work out an efficient way of funding pensions or something. It is something about what, what Swedes call Volkshemmet, uh, the, the people's home. When you're in Sweden, you're at home, right? And when you're at home, you share the common table. And for, a, for quite a while, uh, this has been extended quite easily in, in the most advanced welfare states, like the, 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 the Scandinavian countries, the Netherlands, Britain, uh, the, the, the notion that you could, yeah, some immigrants. Uh, there's that fra uh, phrase often used in, uh, in the Law of Moses about um, uh, various rights that people have if they're part of the, the, the kingdom of Israel and the stranger that is within your gates. In other words, if you've got <clears throat> people from outside who've come to you, they share the rights. And that, that, that held on for quite a long while. It's now under enormous strain because of the numbers. Uh, and that means we have to start thinking about are you, how on earth do you build it? I mean, if we've only got the Ryder Cup of the Eurovision Song Contest, how do you build a notion that these are fellow Europeans, right? and, and, and therefore you should share um, and, and accept that's what you're doing? And especially, how will you ever do that if you grow, go, go towards an increasing division of labor where we say Europe does trade and markets, social policy we do in the nation state. Uh, and that's why I'm worried, um, for all these reasons, I'm worried about this drift to say we, we want the, the, uh, you need a division of labor of that kind. It comes from the left and the right. I mean, in Britain, it comes from this, the, the, uh, the right mainly saying um, we, th this is a trading relationship, nothing else. Right? That's all it's for. It comes from the left saying we've got to defend Swedish institutions against Europe because we're proud of our institutions, they work well. These, the, these are all... I can understand why people say them, but the logic of it would be very, is very dangerous because, as I say, it leads to a division of labor between two levels. It leads to a, a sense that, of a zero-sum game between markets and, and social policy uh, and of where the nation state has to fight for social policy against the market-making uh, international institution when actually uh, we need to do the, the opposite of that and to start saying what, what, what's the, the I, 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 see I'm not, I'm not arguing for a European wide social model um, partly because it, it, a lowest common denominator model would be an extremely mean model indeed uh, but partly because uh, it's a quite different sort of reason I don't believe in a lot of centralization because uh, it's only where you get diversity of points of initiative that you get innovation and change and development. And if we'd had a, a, a European welfare state from the very beginning, which would have been based on the French one, the, 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 we would have been quite a mess. And you would not have Danish flexicurity. You would not have all those interesting innovations that have taken place in the Netherlands and elsewhere in recent years. So you don't want one single model. Uh, and so that a proper subsidiarity, and this is uh, remembering the heritage of the UCD, this is, it's, it's, remember it's St. Augustine, the first person who writes about subsidiarity. It's not an invention of Margaret Thatcher, but I widely believe in Britain. That the notion that you, it, for him it was a division between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. But uh, and it's, it's gradually been reinterpreted to mean you do things at a local level if you can, 
uh, but where you can't, then you have to come up a level. So a need for an intelligent subsidiarity that says we need certain common norms about what is the range of, uh, and so you, as soon as I start spelling it out, I realize how impossible it is. <laughs> what, what, what's the range of acceptable policies in a particular area? But you see, so if one's looking at something like the, 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 the Greek crisis, and you look at the Greek welfare state, and you would, I think anyone would reach the conclusion I reached with the, the, that this is not a model that's going anywhere, actually. The, the, no. Well, the, 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 we, don't, we don't actually want to defend that. We, we do want to move you, bully you, push you, <laughs> set Schäuble on your backs in order to, to change that. But there's a variety of things you might do to change it, a variety of ways you might go. Now, actually, European policymaking did go very heavily in this direction under the thing that called the Open Method of Coordination, or the, like, the Lisbon process whereby uh, it, for a given policy area, and it might be about employment, for example, usually was about employment, uh, you, you t said to countries, right, you've got to have an objective. You've got to maximise the proportion of your, 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 your adult population in employment. What are you going to do? And then they would all come to the table and say, well, we want to do this, we want to do that. And, 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 and eventually, in order to accommodate everyone, that the, it had to get so loosely defined that it became meaningless. Uh, and it's interesting that in the crisis, the Euro crisis, no use has been made of the open method of coordination. Uh, so that, that was far too weak, because the, the Spanish could say, yeah, we're doing flex security, we've got temporary jobs for all our young people. And, and that, that's flexible, because they're the flexible ones and they're the older, the secure ones. That, that isn't what Danish flex security meant. But on the other hand, you can't say everyone has got to be Denmark. You can't all be a, a tiny, highly advanced economy with a very educated population. Uh, you, you can't all suddenly get there. So, but what one, the, 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 there's a problem, obviously, there's political problems here because different interests have got very, these highly controversial areas of policy. But there's also an intellectual problem, a sheer research problem, our business. And that is, what do we know about the range of policies that are likely to help you get out of a mess. The economists know what they want to say. Liberate the market. End of story. And they've got graphs that will show you. Uh, come to sociologists, social policy experts. We say, yeah, well, this has worked here, but mm, you haven't got the infrastructure that's like that. Your, your society had a different trajectory. You probably couldn't do that. These over here done something else. You can see why we don't get listened to and only the economists are listened to. As I said, it's, it, they might not be right, but they're confident. Uh, and so we are at a point where I think the likely development of Europe now is to be towards a division of labor between the European and the national levels. I see this as disastrous. Uh, I see, therefore, a need for Europe to develop a, so knowledge about a range of policies in particular areas that might work, depending on the political balance in particular countries, with then individual countries doing what they like, so long as they're within that range. Uh, now, of course, for a lot of the time, the open method of coordination is fine. Uh, but uh, presumably, we are, certainly within the Eurozone, you're going to increasingly have times when uh, governments get into trouble and where they need to change their direction. And where, because they can't just be parasitical on, on the rest of Europe, they, they need to give some account of themselves. So, yeah, well, we're going to do this. Uh, and if we want them to be able to say, well, we, we, we don't want to just strip away all of our social policy and all of our industrial relations institutions. We actually want to try and shift them and change them in certain directions. And then one assumes some, some equivalent of the Troika is going to come and say, hmm, yes, that, that looks like a feasible one. You can back, we'll back you up on that. We'll fund your debt so long as you're doing that. If you slip back to only giving jobs to people who support one political party, as the Greek government does, then we won't let you do that. But if, if what you want to do is to try and develop some coordinated bargaining, yeah, you can do that, because we know that's worked in some places. Have we got, assuming there was the political will to do that in Europe, have we got the knowledge that we could give them to say, yeah, here's a range of solutions? So uh, I suppose the answer is they're never going to ask us, right? Uh, but were they to? 
can we get ourselves in a position where we might answer them? Thank you.